Hello and welcome to Military Mantra. In this interview, we have today Major Abhay Narayan Sapru, Sena Medal from the One Para Special Forces. In this interview, we'll try to understand his journey of joining Indian Army, life in Indian Army in the Parachute Regiment, and various life lessons that he has learned over his service. So, thank you, sir, for coming on this interview and welcome. Delighted, Akash. Good to be here with you. Uh, sir, if you could, you know, start telling us how was your journey before joining the Forge, and what was your motivation to join the Indian Army. Um, gosh, my father was in the army as a background. And I think for that specific reason, my mother didn't want either of the brothers to join the army for all the separation she had seen. And I joined Delhi University with intentions of following my mother's instructions of not joining the army. The intention then was to sit for my UPSC examinations. And I landed up with some roommates who were from Bihar, senior to me. And by the third year, I saw some of them preparing for their UPC exams. The kind of physical, mental labor they were putting in, 10, 13 hours of studies, I had one look and I realized this is beyond me. If I had to put in labor, it was easier for me to get physical than put in that kind of hard work as far as mental labor was concerned. That's part one. Part two is that any healthy young man would at some stage of his life have a fascination with war and guns and adventure. And if especially you, you come from a foggy background, your father's been in the army and he was half paras and half kumami, then that fascination is even stronger. So I think at some stage in college, perhaps in the third year, I thought it out in my mind that one could leave the army at any stage and become a manager or, or a salesman or whatever you do in CV Street. But there is a very limited time frame to join the army. And if I didn't, I would deeply regret not having done something which I dreamt of, even when I was a little child reading Commando comics. And therefore, I think at some stage in the third year, a decision was taken that I need to at least go and try my hand getting into the army and then take it forward from there and see how it pans out. Mm -hmm. Those Got were the it, motivations. Got it, sir. So, since you are also an author, if you could tell us, you know, the three books that you have written, what was the idea behind it? And, you know, even briefly tell us what are these books actually about? Akash, uh, you know, I was writing... I was writing my experiences uh, while I was in operations. Okay. And I would write them under, you know, lantern lights and walnut trees and sometimes sitting in ambush on scraps okay. of paper. And I would come back to the post and then, you know, write it down by hand. And I would write it all down for my father. So mm. all these would go back to my father in a letter for him to read. I think that was my first experience at putting pen to paper, so to say. And, uh, you know, over a period of time, I have about 20 of these short stories, which have never really got published. Okay. They're still lying around at, at some stage, hopefully. But uh, the first book came out while I was out on an operation and we were climbing, we were hitting a militant camp and we were sitting at a place called Khubal Margi. Okay. At about 10,000 feet. Early morning, we'd climbed the whole night. And I saw the sun rise, and on the horizon, I saw some a range of white, big white mountains, snow covered. And there's one of them which was head and shoulders above the rest of them. And I was wondering, you know, is this the Peer Panjal, is the Shamshabari? What are these big ranges? And I consulted my map, which is when the Gujar guide with us, who'd been an ex-militant himself, peeked over my shoulder and said, You won't find it on the map, sir. That's Nanda Parvat in Gilgit. And I, at that stage, and I say this in my preface to my first book, at that stage, I allowed my mind to sow and I imagined what sort of people these so-called Mujahideen were. Mm -hmm. Were they romantics, adventurers, religious fanatics? And I, you know, I dreamt of maybe if things had been more peaceful, walking across into Gilgit, swath like the Englishman could do. And at that stage, I had this strong desire to capture in a tale the so-called Jihad-e-Kashmir, 
okay. and include all the dramatis personae, the locals, the militants, and the army. And then, you know, I put that book together. It was meant to be a script. I didn't know how to write a script, so it turned into a, a novel. Okay. That's how the first came up, and there's a story behind the second and then the third. I'm, I'm an accidental writer. I'm not a professional writer. Three mm -hmm. of them have been churned out, but, you know, I, I consider myself an amateur writer. Got it. Uh, so, since you are an officer from the Indian Army, and you know, tell us uh, what are the qualities that we look for in an officer? How, how did you evaluate now about, you know, the OLQs? Were you already having it or does it eventually get developed? What is your perspective on the OLQs? You know, I didn't know about OLQ, mm -hmm. frankly, when I went to join the army. And uh, there were no coaching classes um, then. Uh, and I subsequently heard about OLQ when I joined the unit. And I'm told that uh, the OLQ required the qualities required, the number of qualities required were much more in my father's time. And because people, the environment, the culture, everything changed in the country, the quality of the person joining the army changed. So they started dropping the qualities. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, there is an X number of OLQ qualities that they see before they select you. Uh, <clears throat> clearly, some of those qualities have to be there when they're selecting you. Mm -hmm. And there are some which you, you develop, you cultivate, you learn as you go along and you see your seniors and you spend time with the men. Um, but I think, you, you know, uh, specifically, I can't say what SSB is looking at, mm. but I can tell you what my experience in SSB was. Okay. If, if that is what you're looking at, and uh, one can't help anybody in the psychology test. But having said that, as long as you turned out well, you report in time, you come across as social, getting along with the rest of your uh, colleagues because they're watching you all the time. Yeah. They're watching your behavior. They're watching how you, how you perform, how you behave, off duty, on duty, how you eat in the mess. As long as you're eager, and I'm not saying be the first to jump up and raise your hand in everything. You don't need to do that. Mm. Don't be a laggard. Don't be right behind. <laughs> As long as you're there, showing keenness, showing interest, taking part, you are confident and what you say is articulate. You express yourself correctly, even if it's wrong. I think that's by and large, that's good enough. There's a basic physical that you have to clear. Anybody clears it. That's not very important. But otherwise, your confidence, your deportment, your your how articulate you are, how confident you are, some of those things are good enough. Unless you go and mess up your psychology test. That's a different got ballgame. Got it, got it, sir. So you went to IMA, that is Indian Military Academy. So how was your experience there back then and any memories that you have, you know, which you would like to share? Yeah, Akash, I'm one of those idiots who's done more training than is necessary. I went first to the OTA. Achha, okay. And I joined OTA in the summer term. Anybody who's done the summer term, junior term in OTA will tell you it's a bloody tough term to do. With the summer heat, the Chennai heat, 10 minutes in the sun is good enough. So I did four months of that when I got my call from the IMA. Achha. And then I hopped across and joined first term IMA. So I've done maybe two years plus of <laughs> training, which was so unnecessary, absolutely. But if you ask me any spe specific thing that I remember about, uh, about the IMA, my days in the academy, my house, my parents' house was two kilometers away okay. through a tea garden. And the temptation to go and have home food and meet my parents was too strong. So I would hop across, jump the wall and get into trouble. Mm -hmm. By my third term, I had 66 punishments to the extent that the instructors were telling me, behave yourself, pass out in time. Abhe. You're a good guy, but any more punishments and you'll be relegated. And on top of that, I was also the CSM of the company. Uh, company okay. Sergeant Major is a very important uh, position, uh, appointment. You're supposed to be handling the entire company, the discipline, the performance of the company, and the guy selected on leadership and physical fitness, and et cetera. So in spite of having 66 punishment, they still made me the CSM and I continued being the CSM. But frankly, <clears throat> I didn't like the academy. I, you know, temperamentally, I'm not designed for discipline. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to get it over with. 
and get on with life. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it's certainly a necessity. You have to go through it. Mm. You have to become a soldier. Got it. So then how did you make a choice of, you know, joining the parachute regiment and what was your motivation to do that? Akash, my father, as I told you, was half paras, half Kumani. Okay. And I had all intentions of joining either the Kumar battalion, Kumar regiment or a para battalion. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> In my time, they had three commando units. The nomenclature changed later, but yeah. um, those days they used to call them parachute commando units. There was yeah. one, nine, and ten. Okay. Yeah. And then, you know, third term, I recall um, there was a uh, Havaldar Rajinder who turned up from one para. And he came straight from Sri Lanka. The unit was, all three units were committed in Sri Lanka. Uh -huh. And this guy got posted from there. Unfortunately, he died later in, in, in the Northeast in an ambush. And he was a tall, good looking Himachali. And I loved his style. Unlike the other instructors who would rant and scream and punish, he would just sort of smile at you and challenge you with his eyes, you know. And in the breaks, I would then spend time with him, chatting, chatting him about the special forces and his experiences in Sri Lanka and things like that. So I think he had a very large hand in motivating me because what he told me I liked. It was unorthodox soldiering. Mm. As I told you, I, I, I was not very good with this discipline. I don't like it. Deep down, I was a Delhi University man. <clears throat> and uh, what he told me, I liked. You know, he, his words were freestyle soldiering as well. If you soldiering karni hai, aur geru chuna nahi karna hai, to commando unit mein aana hai sa, wahan dadi lambi balam na kam karo. I like the sound of what he was telling me. And I think at that stage, I sort of decided that there's no harm in giving it a try. Worst case scenario, I'll fail the probation. Hmm. And I'll probably go back to a Kumau unit. That's all right. But I shouldn't have any regrets. That's how I volunteered for first para. Got it. Not first para, for the para commandos, they gave me first. <clears throat> uh, so we have, you know, uh, seen videos and heard about the probation. So how, how was your probation back then in the one para? Yeah, uh, Akash, my, my probation was very different because the unit was committed uh, in Sri Lanka. And uh, it was a very interesting probation uh, in a lot of ways. Because when I landed and reported at the unit base up in the hills, mm -hmm. Um, there were just about 30, 40 odd people handling the base. There was one officer who had been wounded. Most of the people who were looking after the rear were all wounded. And um, they made me run my two mile first, which I couldn't because it was a mountain run. I couldn't come in excellent. But I remember reporting there at about um, 3.30. I was completely wet. It was raining. It was January. And I was marched into the adjutant's office. And I write all this in my book. In my second book, you'll find this. And uh, he looked up and he said, what do you want to do? So I said, sir, I'd like to have some lunch. So he abused me. He said, I'm not talking about bloody lunch. I'm talking about PPT or PPT, mm -hmm. right? So I said, sir, PPT. I've just reported straight. So PPT would be fine, which is in your PT kit. Mm -hmm. The one mile run and a series of other tests. So four o'clock, so and so place report there. <clears throat> so I remember four o'clock, no lunch, reporting there. And I find a chap called Jay Baksh, who finally retired as the Subedar Major of the unit. And I mention him by name in my book. And Jay Baksh was standing there on that cold January afternoon uh, with his hands under his armpits, wearing a sweater, the OG green sweater, mm. and carrying a stopwatch. Didn't salute me, didn't wish me, looked me up and down. <clears throat> And his first question was, how old are you, sir? So I said, I'm 22. He says, I'm 32. If you can keep up with me, you will come in excellent. Follow, clicked, and ran. I was very insulted. I said, bloody old guy. I said, I'm going to keep up with him. Let's see. <clears throat> so I kept pace with him till he took a corner, and there was a 60-degree climb straight up. Mm. And he shifted gear leaned into the slope and there was a fog I still remember there was a mist coming along and he sprinted up the slope and disappeared and I came up and I came down and I and I saw him standing exactly the way he was when I had met him with his arm tucked not a not a sweat on his brow pluck he says fail I said 
सब फेल नहीं हो सकते क्या टाइम है यू टोल मी द टाइम आई सो दैट्स गुड ही सेज इन हेयर देर इज नो गुड ऑफ फेयर माई बॉय इन हेयर इज ओनली एक्सेलेंट सो आई सेल दिस इज अ माउंटेन रन साहब आई एम श्योर दे मज से डोंट टॉक नाउ सो देर नो माउंटेन हेयर दैट वॉज माई फर्स्ट एक्सपीरियंस एंड देन they ask me what do you want to do because there is shortage of time you either report you fail you get out or you report to sri lanka mm-hmm. in four days time you have orders either you by and large convince us you good enough or you go so i said i'll do my 40 km speed march this you do with about 60 pounds of weight but cutting the full st- uh, story short 5 hours 45 minutes was the excellent time at about 30 32 km <clears throat> it, it had already got dark we started at 2 in the afternoon and I didn't know it then, but now I know that this is something that they do quite often. They had a villager come along. I was tired. I was fast walking. Jay Baksh was running with me. He was the pacer, and a villager comes along on a cycle, and he gets into conversation with me, and he says, "Well, why are you doing this? Why are you punishing yourself? Why don't you keep that rucksack on my that weight on my bicycle?" Yeah. Mm-hmm. Why don't you sit? I'll give you a lift. And Jay Baksh also chips in. He says, "Sir, I mean, no problem. It's dark. Uh, Captain Sahib is also not around. The adjutant who's taking a circuit, he's not around. Take a couple of kilometers on the cycle. I don't know what clicked in my mind. I was tempted, but then I said, you know, something's fishy here. So I said, no, I'll carry my weight. I'll finish. At five forty-five, one or four or five minutes short of that, I saw. You know, I was latching onto that." lantern light which had been kept kept on top of the um three ton which had been parked on the road mm. at 5 5 minutes short of my excellent time i land there completely dehydrated and uh, the adjutant drives up from behind in his jonga and he looks at me and he says all right there's a bridge ahead 1 km ahead you will touch it and you will come back and you have exactly 7 minutes to do that and now we'll see if you are special forces material or not okay. any drove off mm. oh you know much later i realized that there is an old adage in the special forces they firmly be- believe that it is not possible to know how much is enough mm. until one has experience how much is more than enough mm. now he was testing me he wanted to see can i do i have because you are physically and psychologically locked on to a certain distance and time mm. he's broken out of it and now he wants to see now at that stage he drove off my reaction was i threw my pitu down i threw the rifle and i was swaying i remember and i said thank you very much i'm not doing anything more i had a point to prove this is it in my mind i had already decided i'm going back to a kumar betel at this stage Jay Baksh, who had been my NCO for mm-hmm. four days, my probation NCO, he says, "You're going to regret this, boy. You're going to regret this all your life. You've done a good job till now. Just for two kilometers, you will carry this regret for the rest of your life." And he picked up the rucksack, he picked up the rifle, and he started running. He started dragging me. At that stage, the men, and there was another JCO there. Uh-huh. he also started running at that stage they had decided that i was good enough you see and it's very important in an sf unit that the mm-hmm. men take a liking to you and at some stage in any probation the feedback from the men is taken very informally or formally the men are asked do you think he will fit in with us mm-hmm. a no can be taken very seriously so i you know i picked up my rucksack i picked up my rifle and that was the toughest 2 km i ever did in my life you know i cross my excellent timing but you know i had a feeling that by and large they are happy with what they've seen and then they made me finish my 2 mile which i had failed which okay. i was not clearing in they wouldn't leave me i reported in sri lanka i would go out on operation and in the evening if there was free time they w- there would be a road opening uh, you would find these guys with ak's on both sides and an 800 meter uh, distance was measured out mm-hmm. and they made sure that i cleared my 2 mile Mm-hmm. much later when i wrote my second book on sri lanka i went i have pictures it was uh, it was very nostalgic standing there on that road it's a shiny big road now the indians have contributed there for road building okay. and i stood there and i reminisced about running on that road 
but Not that was the probation. People have three months, one and a half months. You know, if if the unit had been there, it's a different experience. Mine was all alone with no guidance, nothing, mm. and then straight into combat. And then they were seeing me how good I was in combat. Of course, I would walk right behind in the column. There was to be a havaldar keeping an eye on me, uh, and that was you know the probation. Uh, so I have a question. You know, uh, they are already testing you for the qualities during your service selection board, right? And now they are again testing you for certain qualities. So what are they looking for now? in the probation of course basic above average fitness certainly mm. you cannot even dream of reporting if you are not above average physically mm. but personally i feel uh, attitude is one of the most important things they they firmly believe that even if you are physically not that fit not that fit the unit just the fact that you will be you will be living and operating uh, with such fit men the unit will make you reach certain level of fitness mm -hmm. so maybe they can still sacrifice on fitness to some extent but if you don't have the attitude they are not going to accept you so they will push you to see what is that chink where is the chink in the armor we had people we had people who were physically very fit doing exceedingly well and then you know somewhere under pressure they would make a mistake there were guys who were doing exceedingly well and suddenly in the 40 km speed march the nco would suggest you know there's a shortcut here huh. and he would fall for it right or oh, why don't you put your rucksack he'll take it or the nco would suddenly disappear a villager will turn up he'll try and tempt you mm. and your mind now at that stage under pressure with all the exhaustion is looking for chances to relax to get away and get it and people made these mistakes hmm. you know they will they will try and crack you they will try and push you as i said more than enough they want to see can you go beyond what you have and not crack so hmm. consistency um, attitude and every man i remember while i was there four days and then back in sri lanka while the probation hmm. was on even the youngest paratrooper would only say one thing is up commando is not in the leg you know he'd say gorde mein nahi hai कमांडो यहां है साहब सारा खेल यहां है इसको इसको तगड़ा रखना साहब ये तगड़ा है तो पास है ये गड़बड़ हुई तो गड़बड़ हुई नाउ बेसिकली व्हाट दे आर सेइंग इज एटीट्यूड इज व्हाट दे आर सीइंग यू क्रैक देयर एंड थिंग्स लाइक दैट दे आर नॉट इंटरेस्टेड इन चेकिंग सम ऑफ द क्वालिटीज व्हिच द आर्मी इज ऑलरेडी चेकड बाय एंड लार्ज यू नो देयर इज अ लेवल दैट द आर्मी इज ऑलरेडी डन दैट्स दे आर सीइंग नाउ यू हैव समथिंग मोर सो इफ यू सो अ uh sf unit if you saw the officers and i'm sure the men also to that extent it was a motley collection of adventurers romantics misfits misfits they were most of them were professional soldiers they were not career soldiers mm -hmm. there's a huge difference i was very clear i'm going to leave at what stage i don't know but i'm here for this adventure so i'm going to give 110% to my soldiering this is unorthodox soldiering this is purest form of soldier mm. i'd like to volunteer for everything finish it when i have done and dusted with it i like to go back to cv street mm. so it encouraged eccentrics to all kinds of crazy guys um, and then you see can he work in a team and can he work independently can he take the pressure and the pressures are enormous some of our operations in sri lanka for example you had to sit in mobile for 72 hours in an ambush try sitting in a chair and we're talking about sitting in a bush ah. taking one sip of water every 2 hours it was terrible and then you do it do the same thing up in the mountains in the cold 15000 14000 when your hunting patrols go out heavily loaded mm. it's not an easy job and the men are strong if you're not you're not strong enough you're not going to be able to lead them i got you and the pressure starts in a fire fight the pressure starts you have casualties so if they they make mistakes and mistakes are made mm. the mistakes are made but then the system is also allowed that if you make a mistake if the selection has made a mistake mm. and at some stage either you'll crack up and you'll say thank you very much i go back to my parent unit all of us have parent units mm. all the commanding officer will send you non para Yeah, you're not good enough. Not not carrying a weight. You go home. 
So at any given stage in an SF unit, you have a bunch of people who are honed for perfection. It's a very demanding job. You know, it's not an easy job. You're either passionate about it or you're not. Mm. You can't do it otherwise. Got it. You Got it. Do it. So, so right after probation, you went to Sri Lanka and that's where a part of your probation continued there. So your first yeah. combat experience was also there itself, I presume. Yeah. Yes. Correct. So how was that for? So, um, Akash, um, I was going out on patrols, uh, these so-called um, hunting parties, you know, on, on intelligence sometimes and random because you've had intercepts showing movement of LTT. In. Most of my operations were basically uh, not in built up, but in the forest, in the jungles. And we were doing um, 48 hours, 36 hours, 72 hours operations, um, ambush. But my first uh, contact was, uh, I wish you'd read the second book because I mentioned this operation also in that. There was a, there was a battalion which had been mauled by the LTT. Okay. A lot of battalions were mauled. And it had been badly mauled, the commanding officer killed, Subhada Major killed, uh, a lot of people were missing, which is when they flew in the commandos. They flew in one para team, they flew in a one para team. And we landed on that on that uh, hillock, which had their battalion headquarters. And reports were coming in that they had lost a lot of people. Uh, anyway, to cut the whole story short, next morning, the post was attacked. It was attacked by an LTT party. And uh, I was asked to lead a, a counter attack. Mm -hmm. in which killed a couple of LTT, wounded a, a few. Um, but, you know, that's not the important thing. The important thing is, is, the, is the fact that till then I was a novice a rookie lieutenant who had just cleared his probation, trying to lead very seasoned, hardened soldiers. Mm -hmm. and that bond has still to develop. Right. And I recall there was a lot of fire coming on the post. And um, I, we were all lined up behind a temple wall. And I was told by the commanding officer, please go down, attack. They were firing from another hillock. Mm -hmm. And I looked back and I just said to my number two, chap called Satish, I said, I'm going down. Whoever wants to follow can follow. And I ran down that hillock. And for about 50, 60 meters, there was no one behind me. Mm. And I said, Shit, I'm the only guy. Nobody's following me. This is what happens when you join a new unit. And then soon I had my entire troop behind me. We fired an RL. I ran a little further, which is when the chap called Zile Singh, big jot, he caught my wrist. He says, Ghana ho gaya ab. You know, he looked at me. He said, Ghana ho gaya. I mean, ab zada ho gaya. And then he looked at a couple of the boys in the troop. He says, Aage. After that, they made sure that I was not, you know, running ahead. And he, he kept to me, kept holding me back. Yeah, you're 22, you know, you don't know what is right, what is wrong. It, the fact that you could get killed doesn't even come to your mind. No young man thinks that he'll ever die. These are seasoned people. They knew the lieutenant doesn't know a shit about what is happening here. He's just bloody taking off. He wants to probably establish himself, whatever his reasons are. But at that stage, having tested me, this is what I say about this army. They'll first test you. Having tested me, having seen that the guy can lead. After that, they made sure that, you know, the risk was mitigated to a large extent. And then you had a couple of guys ahead of me always. One guy right next to me. And then there was smooth sailing. Never had a problem after that. That one operation, and I knew as far as these men are concerned, we are brothers. Got it. No problems. Got it, sir. Sir, so since you are a paratrooper, so how, how was your first experience, you know, when you jumped out of an aircraft? How, and when did that happen for you? Because you were in Sri Lanka, right? I came back from Sri Lanka, which is when all the other courses started. And uh, one of them was your uh, basic uh, parachuting course. First jump, of course, you know, you train for about 20 days, uh, ground mm -hmm. training. First jump, of course, you're excited, but you're clueless. Mm -hmm. Ignorance is bliss. So you really don't know what is happening. But second jump, yes, I was scared. I was scared and I'm still scared. I was scared of heights. I'm still scared. And what invariably happens is 
the airborne forces follow a, a rule where anywhere risk is concerned, risk to life, the senior most must always lead. So the number one on the stick is always the senior most. And the senior most, if you don't have too many jumps to back you up, standing at the door and looking down with the wind gushing in and you know the atmosphere, is, you can cut it with a knife. So the second jump on was yes, but then then you know you learn to you learn to control your affair, you learn to start enjoying it. Uh, unless it's a foreign DZ, and then you load it, it's a night jump, you load it with weight, mm -hmm. then it's a little dicey. But normal jumps in Agra were fine, no problem. Uh, so since you have also operated, you know, in the valley and also with uh, Major Sudhir Varya, if you could, you know, uh, share few experiences that you had there. Oh, there were so many experiences, Akash. So many experiences, but you know, I don't know how to share. Um, <clears throat> so I didn't go with the SF unit. You know, and the RR raising was on, Rashtra okay. rifle raising. Mm -hmm. And at some stage, the higher ups decided that they wanted to raise a commando RR unit on mm -hmm. something called the son of the soil concept, i.e., form a unit which has Kashmiri Muslims from Jackalai battalions. You have Dogras from the Dogra regiment. You throw in some paratroopers and a nucleus of uh, SF operators. Mm -hmm. Commanding officer and self were from, uh, were from uh, a commando unit or an SF unit and about 20, 30 other ranks from nine, 10 and one. Then you had paratroopers and the objective was that we would be in a position to train them in special ops and then the unit being locals, they would be in a position to garner more surrenders, get, gather intelligence, etc. So it was an experimental unit. So I operated with them across the valley. So those experiences are varied. But uh, Sudhir was there. Sudhir is an old, was an old friend of mine. And uh, anybody who knows Sudhir will tell you that he didn't know fair. You see, all of us have a threshold for fair. Mm. And, uh, and this man didn't know fair. The threshold levels were so high that perhaps he didn't understand that there could be, there could be serious consequences of taking huge risk. I once asked him, and I asked him because the, there's a place called, I think, Red Nag or something, up in Lola Valley. Okay. We had, some, we had some information, so I went with my troop. I climbed up, I sat there in ambush on the ridge line, thick forest. Um, 24 hours I sat there, no movement, nothing. I came down in the evening at about 5.36. When I came down the hill, I find Sudhir Walia with his troop sitting around there. So I said, Sudhir, waste of time, buddy. I've just cleaned up the ridge, no movement, nothing. You're wasting. I said, you go home, Baba. Go home, go home. We'll get out. He climbed up. He climbed. Later, he's telling me. He climbs up, 5.36, day, hitting the ridge line. And he sees a man in, in a, in a uh, firan or a mm. blanket carrying a, that milka dolu. So he says, Salaam alaikum. He, you know, Sudhir would often wear firan going into combat. He says, Salaam alaikum, alaikum salam. The rest of the troop is below. And then he sees the weapon and he shoots him point blank. And Sudhir has enough stories like this. And at some stage, I asked him, I remember, God bless his soul, what a man. I asked him because I realized that the, the difference between this man getting killed and I'm not getting killed. I'm making effort. Both of us are making effort. He gets the kills. Where do I slip up? Mm. I asked him, what is the problem? He says, and I said, you take too many risks, Sudhir. Tread careful, boy. You'll have a problem. Because his stories were, I followed him, I shot him from behind. And this is very close conversation, distance that you're shooting someone. Mm -hmm. He says, um, you know, um, you people think I take high risk. These are very calculated risks. These are very calculated risks. I know how he will react. I know how much reaction time. This is, this is a soldier who's on a different level. He says, I know how much reaction time he has. I know how he'll react. I know the chances of him getting a headshot 
I am prepared to take a shot anywhere else in the body, not a fatal shot. So in that panic, if he fires, I'm unlucky. I'll probably get it in my arm and I'm, take, I'm prepared to take that risk. But for him to get a headshot, I've taken those calculations. That was his explanation to me. That's the kind of man he was. Mm. And there's a very interesting story, which I have a short story, which I wrote. Someday it will get published. Is a story that he told me sitting there. Okay. And this is not the right place. It's a very interesting story of an experience he had. Mm. And I wrote it later as a short story. Uh, but perhaps the bravest man I've met. Mm. Bar, bar a man called Gul Muhammad Pagal. And that is an experience I can never talk about, who was a Gujar militant. Okay. And he was also one hell of a brave man. But uh, Sudhir Walia was right there on top. Right there on top. In our times. Got it. I mean, there must be people, but in our times, there was nothing. There was, see, luck is also very important, Akash, in combat. Mm. In my time, uh, there were four people. Uh, two were from nine. And one was from 10, one was from one. The men knew that when they stepped out, the joke was contact will happen. Mm. You see, it, luck, luck is important in everything in life. And it goes to also for combat. Got it. Out, of the four, out of the four, two are dead. Mm. The other guy from nine, again, very fine man, just wrote here. Okay. So he dead, just he dead. One's a uh, major general, mm -hmm. and the other guy is out of the army, and he's a very rich man now. So and those are those are enough combat stories. But uh, so since you are also an ADC, two two of the chiefs, if you could tell us, you know, how was your life back then as an ADC? How does it look like? Highly stressful, Akash. I actually turned up to set up the security for General Rodericks. Okay. He came in the Zulu category, and at that stage, the um, uh, the Delhi police requested the army that um, security be provided to the chief. Obviously, it had to be from the army, so I was um, sent in to organize his security, and I had my men, and they would rotate between, just a minute, they would rotate between 1, 9, and 10, um, and subsequently, he's supposed to have two ADCs, the chief has. So mm -hmm. the other ADC was being taken out um, and they wanted another ADC. So at some stage they called me and they, they said, you know, the chief wants you as the ADC. So you are now selected. So you will double over. Sometimes when the need arises, you will be also looking after his protection. Otherwise, you will do the ADC functions also. When he left, I was then told to set up the security for General Joshi. I mean, basically handed over. So I, I moved around with him for about eight months and handed mm -hmm. it over to another, another officer from the SF. Got it. But yeah, it, it's a different kind of a life. You're seeing the army right from the top. Right? You, before that, you've been existing in the bloody bush, trying to survive. And suddenly you are there at the highest echelon of the army. There's nothing beyond that. Mm -hmm. And you see how larger formations and staff officers and how the rest of the army works. So from a learning perspective, brilliant. Both the good and the ugly, you see both from that position. Uh, but the, stressful because, you know, you handling the chief, you can't go wrong. Mm -hmm. You're always on call. So, but a great time, two years in Delhi, two and a half years in Delhi. Not too bad. That's the only peace posting perhaps I had. And about six, seven months, eight months in Bangalore before I left. Yeah. Otherwise, the rest of it is all up in the bush, mm -hmm. mountains bush. Got it. So you have been in Para SF, and you know we call it special forces. So what makes them so special that you call them special? What is so different about them? Akash, uh, <clears throat> in a 1.3 million volunteer army, you then have a second bunch of people who volunteer. In my time, there were lesser number of units. Now they've expanded the SF. Mm. Nevertheless, they would, in my reckoning, perhaps form under 1%, under 1% of the army in size. 
rejection rates first you are a volunteer to the army then you are a volunteer you know sign a bond saying if anything happens to you the government of india is not responsible etc mm. etc et then they put you through 90 days of hell rejection rates are 85 80 to 85% and then you can be kicked out any time or you can leave any time okay so you imagine the, the, you imagine, you're the you're the tip of the spear mm -hmm. once you're selected and you've done your specialization courses and you've had your combat experience you're extremely conscious all the time of mm -hmm. the fact that this is the best the army has if you are asked to go in for a task there's nothing after you mm -hmm. there's nothing after you you're the tip and therefore it's a very task oriented organization which is held together by a bunch of people who are volunteer after a volunteer then selected after a very tough probation and trained to perfection to the extent possible we don't play games we had people who had played who reported for probation and who had played uh, services squash mm -hmm. other game they were told please hang your racket on the ball there's no time for games we only train so they are always training they always training got it so when you are there at that stage of perfection it's like a race course you can keep training it and then you have to release it yeah, the guy is going to run he wants to test himself you want to test yourself you are at a stage where once you are launched five guys six guys you feel the confidence you spend so much time together with your men with your weapons with your training that you feel the confidence come on let's see let's test it out which is the only difference they are fantastic uh, infantry units huh? mm. given the role that they do they are fantastic units huh? great fighting units okay. now everybody is different you ask me to do a uh, kargil as a sf guy you ask me to charge a defended locality i'm scared i don't know the infantry guy will fix his bayonet and charge share bravery I'll probably turn around and tell you, no, 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 no. Give me time. Let the darkness come. I'll go behind his back. I'll cut off his retreat. I'll do this. I'll do that. That's my style. That's my training. Mm -hmm. I'll ambush, ambush him on his way back, and you know, because any good SF guy, the first thing you need to know is that you must know when to walk away from a fight. Mm -hmm. So ours is a very unorthodox type of fighting. Right? We want to dictate the fight, and the thinking is different. The teaching is different. Uh, you put us in a in a normal conventional infantry role perhaps we'll do well they will do well because you know they are trained mm. they are volunteer they will do well but that's not our job okay that's to say infantry great excellent bunch of people mm. great fighting units huh? got it uh, sir i have seen a lot of photos on your website as well uh, you know from your days so what was your favorite weapon in the combat i have carried an ak okay i have always carried an ak i uh, now go back to my unit sometimes and i'm you know you go and try and fire the new weapons which have come very good looking very very nice weapons they've got but you know unfortunately or fortunately i only landed up carrying an ak okay. so my love for the ak and for an open sight now they have sights and uh, you know trevor and m1s and all sorts of fancy weapons great weapons great weapons but uh, an ak is an ak no stoppages ever Got no it. stoppages. Uh, so, so, since you have also, you know, uh, served in the Indian Army for around a decade, if I can ask you any three life lessons that you have learned from your service which you still cherish, what would they be? Uh, qualities that I learned from the army. Hmm. Oh, there's so many. Uh, it's not over till it's not over. So you fall down five times, get up six times, dust yourself, get on with it. it's not done till it's not done mm -hmm. um consistency hard work and one of the most important things discipline very important a lot of qualities go into making a man successful one of the most important things i would reckon that i learned was discipline do what you have to do as the saying goes do what you have to do when you have to do it even if you don't like doing it 
now i go for a run i am a distance runner there are times i am get cold there are times that i don't want to run more times that i don't want to run than run but something that has been ingrained in me i'll go and stand on the road i'll report 7 o'clock on the road i'll stand there i'll go for a walk doesn't matter today i don't feel like running but as i said you know do what you have to do when you have to do it even if you don't like doing it so so some of those things and there were other qualities of how to manage people mm. uh, having served in the sf and having gone through what i've gone through cv street i think i don't think so i ever panicked i find the department talking about a big crisis and i'm looking at it and i'm saying well nobody's dead mm. there's nobody firing at you you go home in the evening so what's the crisis which was also a negative because there are times in cv street where you got to understand and and realize that this is a serious thing this is serious for everybody around you and you supposed to get serious about this issue and to you that issue is just there's nothing to it mm. how to address a problem you know some of those things people get intimidated when they are faced with a problem mm. it's too large it overwhelms them stops their thinking they don't have the ability to break it into pieces you know some of those things let's do this let's first walk from point a to point b so if you start equating what you learned and did in the army in the sf to some other situations outside there are lot, lots of things my life in cv street has been made easy mm. ek because of the time i spent in the sf it's been a piece of cake believe oh. me not once felt the stress of working outside mm. got it uh, so my final question to you would be you know because a lot of aspirants will be watching this what will be your message to all of them who wants to join the forces they must work hard i'm not going to specific so how they going to do it but this is something that you will regret if there is a passion and a desire don't do it for a job mm. don't do it because you have nowhere else to go it's not the same market that it used to be in my time there are plenty of opportunities outside you don't have the heart for soldiering and i'm talking talking about only soldiering eh? the army is a big place when i talk i talk only about combat arms mm. i'm not talking about their the asc ordnance it's a great profession to be in but i'm specifically talking about soldiering i e combat arms if you don't have it in you don't go into the army just because you want to earn a living mm. you're a very miserable man you won't do justice go outside be a salesman get into it whatever but if there's a passion do it now or there'll be a regret there'll always be a regret that you never ever tested yourself out what your metal is mm. so by all means i'd be very happy if there's a whole bunch of people youngsters there and i'm very happy now because i get mails and sometimes messages from a few people who read the book quite a few mm. join the end there's some who uh, ask me for advice on how to join the sf and stuff like that so oh, i think the greatest thing that i've managed to do with those books is to motivate people a you know, whole bunch of people to join the army or join the nd and stuff like that so yes if you're an aspirant you must and what better yeah what better than even if you want to get out some stage get out mm. but what better, is there a better way to spend your youth than doing some of these things i i just came back i go skiing every every year in this trip i went across to you know to gorez valley mm. the friends of mine are there commanding it was minus 17 in the valley and i looked up the poster up there on the lc and i looked up and i asked the brigade commander a poor chap sitting what height is that this is about 16 that's 17 that's what's the temperature is minus 35 he stuck for winter 6 months he stuck is sitting there mm. tough life very tough life right it is only when you see it in close quarters mm. do you realize how demanding this um, the profession can be it's very difficult to explain to the uninitiated mm. aap bombay mein rehte hain aapko main bolu minus 17 minus 20 aapko kuch pata hi nahi hai 17 se 20 20 se 25 it's the same thing i know it's cold mm. how cold you got to go and see it with ventral factor 
then going into combat, then trying to, you know, try and take, have a contact with an infiltrating group, then having a contact and someone gets shot. There's bad weather, there's no chopper coming. You see a guy bleeding there. Mm -hmm. He's dying. He's one of your men. It's, it's a different life. It's a different experience. Got it, sir. So, uh, thanks a lot, sir, for your time on this session. I hope, you know, a lot of people uh, will understand life in special forces and also will get to know a lot about, you know, about your books and things that you've written there. And uh, thanks again, sir, for your time on this session. Jai Hind, sir. Thank you very much, Akash. Jai Hind, Akash. Stay fit, stay strong. Keep doing the good work. Bye-bye. Eh? Yeah,